All right. So as everyone is joining, hello, hello, and um, welcome everyone to another Setbacks in Medicine discussion. Um, you know, good morning for those who are tuning in where it's morning, good afternoon, you know, wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, so for those of you who are maybe tuning in to one of these Setbacks in Medicine discussions for the first time, I want to give just kind of a short summary of, you know, the purpose of these sessions. Um, so really the purpose of these setbacks in medicine discussions is to share stories of mistakes and setbacks in medicine. And importantly, you know, what helped us persevere and move through these setbacks, because I think we can all, you know, learn from, uh, you know, the mistakes and kind of the lessons learned from everyone. And uh, the theme for this discussion is, I wish I had known. And we have some really fantastic people here um, at different stages of training who will share stories um, related to this theme. Uh, but I do want, I did want to say that in addition to, you know, Moses and Promise here sharing stories, I wanted to, you know, say up front that this is really an open discussion we can learn from everyone. So please feel free to unmute and share your own experiences, stories, reflections on what other people have shared. We can all learn from everyone. Um, so without further ado, maybe we'll jump into some, some introductions. So Moses, maybe we can start with you. And um, if you could share just a little bit about yourself, you know, where you are in training, some things you like, but then also um, why do you think it's valuable to talk about mistakes and setbacks in medicine? Sure, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's fun to see uh, faces old and new and to sort of be able to share a little bit about the more personal side of medicine. So um, my name is Moses. I, by way of background, uh, come from a family from Jamaica and from Costa Rica. Um, I grew up mostly in Florida um, and did undergrad in Florida, med school at Penn in Philly. Um, and I'm now a third year internal medicine resident um, at Brigham and Women's Hospital in, in Boston. Um, I'm going to be uh, pursuing a hematology oncology career and applying now in fellowship. So sending good vibes to everyone who's applying for anything. Uh, in the it's, uh, <laughs> it's a long and fun process. Um, and I, I do think it's important to have these conversations because one, I think it's a universal experience. Um, it's easy when looking at CVs or, you know, when you hear people give talks, it seems like there's this inexorable sort of progress towards greatness. Um, and I think what's a, a pretty universal experience is that there are insecurities internally, there are challenges externally, and um, we don't talk about it enough. And I think uh, by talking about it, we, we humanize this whole process. Um, and we also build a community of people who are supporting each other, who are cheering each other on, um, because this is really a joint, a joint exercise. So I'm excited to hear from, from Promise and from, from everyone else here. Yeah, thank you so much, Moses. I, I completely agree. And I, um, we all really appreciate you being here and, and, and taking the time. Um, Promise, would love for you to also introduce yourself and um, share something you know, about yourself that you, that you enjoy. And then also, why do you think it's valuable to have these conversations about mistakes and setbacks? Oh no, I don't think we can hear you. Or maybe that's just me. I see that you're unmuted, but can can everyone else hear her? I'm still I'm having a hard time. No, I can't hear. You can't hear her either. We'll give her a moment. Hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Woo! Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, but my name no is. No worries. And I am a third year medical student at Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine. And um, I am currently on my second rotation of surgery. And I think I've always been interested in IM or GI, but I rotated through neurology and I really like that. So that's really high on the differential right now. And outside of medicine, I just love being active. I love enjoying the outdoors and spending time um, getting to know people. 
I think that is important to talk about the setbacks in medicine because very similar to Moses' reasons, I just feel that um, like medicine is really hard to go through and it's not meant to go through alone. And I think that it's really important to, I think the culture could make it feel like, you know, you have to be really tough. You have to figure things out on your own and, you know, like, like it's on you to make it work. Um, but I think there's a lot of value in sharing the struggle with other people and reflecting on, you know, the heart lessons or, you know, the times when you um, feel like you made a mistake or you failed and with the people around you to, like Moses says, like humanize this process and make it like normalize it because it's something that we all experience. Thank you so much, Promise. I. Um... I completely agree. And I think, uh, you know, we can kind of all relate to maybe kind of the culture of medicine that we feel sometimes we're um, kind of having to put our head down and not often kind of share the, the difficulties that we that we all face. So thank you again for being here. Um, Moses, if it's all right, we, I would love to kind of start with you. And, you know, the, the theme is I wish I had known. So feel free to just interpret that in any way you wish and um what story comes to mind when you when you hear that when i was reflecting on things i wish i had known and the overall path to medicine i really looked at it through the lens of some of the advocacy and research work that i've done in thinking about um, not only the very real challenges once you're already in medicine but the the path into the profession itself and in doing a little bit of self-reflection, thinking back to my high school self, um, I don't think my high school self or even my you know, elementary and middle school self could have dreamed of, of where I am today. And that's through a series of luck and parental support and mentors. Um, and you know, instead of picking maybe one particular story, I'd throw a few things out there, um, separated in, in in space and time, as the as the neurologists like to say, um, and uh, and use it as a as a catalyst for for conversation. So, when I was in uh, in elementary school, which is far removed from medical school and from medical training, um, I I had a, a semi traumatic experience where I was bullied, and um, there were actually um, threats made against my life. And my parents uh, were so frightened they pulled me out of school. And ever since then, uh, and I was homeschooled for a period of time, um, challenges sort of in getting a, an educational situation set up. And I've carried this sort of um, uh, uncertainty and sort of, I wouldn't call it shame because I had a great time and a great experience, but I think there's a reputation for folks who have been homeschooled that they're uh, maybe antisocial or um, there's something off about uh, folks who have taken that path. Um, and I think I, partly I wish I had known that even curveballs in life, um, if you have a supportive environment around you and you hold tight to close friends and family, it can be a source um, for personal growth. And I think that that experience for me made me not competitive because there wasn't anyone to compete with. Um, it helped me sort of integrate more closely with my family and with other kids of various ages. Um, and it's affected my personality, how I approach medicine, how I approach work, you know, decades after the fact. Jumping ahead a little bit, I, I did end up going back to, to high school. Um, and everyone, I, I was doing well academically and everyone around me um, was saying, oh, Moses is going to, you know, go to some fancy school because, you know, he's so smart, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I felt this great, uh, pressure to, to live up to people's expectations. And, um, I applied to, you know, many schools, Northeast California, one of my close friends went to Stanford and I was rejected from, from every school. And, um, I wasn't even accepted to the, uh, flagship state school where I grew up in Florida. And so I ended up going to the university of central Florida. And I think it sort of surprised a lot of people. And I wish I'd known then that, you know, at, at the end of the day, prestige doesn't really matter all that much, that what matters is your character, 
your um, passion for what you do, um, your willingness to invest in yourself and in others. Um, and I think the rest of my trajectory in medicine has sort of proved that to be true in my case, where, you know, I think it's easy now, at, like ending residency at a program that's, you know, considered to be a very good one um, with all of these like nice accolades. But I'm no different today having all of that fancy stuff on my CV as I was when I was rejected from all of those schools, right? I'm the same person with the same, I hope, values, with the same goals. Um, I'm no more worthy of a person today than I was back then. And my friends who have taken various paths, um, I consider them just as worthy as, as myself. And I think that these experiences of succeeding on the path to medicine and things that seem like setbacks or failures, reframing them with the help of your mentors and your, and your friends and taking those opportunities um, and running with them can change your life. And they've certainly, certainly changed mine. And I'm happy to reflect on times in medical school and in, and in residency, which presents their own challenges, but I wanna make space for other people to, to talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Moses. I think, um, and you know, everyone feel free to unmute and share your thoughts and also put your thoughts in the chat. I would love to hear everyone's reflections here. I think um, something that stands out to me about what you just said is kind of reframing these points that in, in the time feel like either failures or just mistakes or big setbacks and reframing them as, as points of growth. And I'm, you mentioned kind of how mentorship can help you do that, but I'm curious, like, what has helped you personally, like in that process of, of reframing? So I think that's something that, you know, I'm continuing to, to learn and I'm sure a lot of people are too. Yeah, as you were talking, I was thinking about my specific mentors um, and maybe I'll shout a few out and specific things that they did for me. So there was a primary care physician in Florida who is Jamaican American, um, had been in the community for, you know, 30, 40 years. And um, he took me under his wing and went above and beyond in terms of, it wasn't just me showing up in clinic with him. He taught me physical exam maneuvers as like a freshman in college. He would assign me um, presentations to give on various medications or common diseases. And what developed between us over time was not only a, I'm showing up to get something from you, but it was very much like apprenticeship model. I looked up to him as someone like, I want to be like you, maybe not in the specifics of your career, but in the spirit that you bring to clinic, um, your dedication to your patients. Um, and that's a relationship that has persisted um, over you know, the last 10 years. Um, I'm thinking of a mentor in, in college. Well, if, if you want to throw out another, <laughs> another setback, um, I, I want to have a research career uh, in, in leukemia and, and bone marrow transplantation. But as an undergrad, I joined a lab and I had friends who were publishing a bunch of papers and I felt a lot of pressure because I was getting ready to apply for medical school. And I was like, oh my goodness, I don't have any papers. And I spent years in this lab and I didn't publish anything. But what I did learn um, were concrete skills. And this mentor was unselfish. And so he said, you know, I think that through my connections, I can get you to a place where the resources are even greater, right? And there've been a series of mentors who don't hog me or, or feel like I have to stick with them. And that if there's someone else who's a better fit, they will pass me on, um, not to sever the relationship, but to take a next step. Um, and that was true of my mentor in undergrad. It was true for my mentors in medical school. The whole reason I'm here in Boston is because my mentor in medical school said, you know, my lab is doing something a little different than what you're interested in. I'm going to send you to Boston to um, meet with someone else who is now my primary mentor. So I think finding mentors that are interested in you for you and for your growth, not for you as someone who can deliver a product for them. It's a little bit of both, honestly, but um, those are the mentors that for me have been the most impactful. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think um, I, uh, 
definitely agree that just mentors can be can be so so transformative in your career and sometimes it's you know hard to exactly find them but um i think it's really really powerful when they can kind of support you in in your goals and not necessarily kind of the goals that they um, have for themselves uh promise i wanted to see if you had any reflections to what moses shared i am just in awe of everything that moses is sharing because i feel that the lesson that you have learned now that you are um, several years ahead of me are the lessons that I have to learn in my first two years of medical school. And a lot of that, it's like my talk will be focused on, you know, the character that you mentioned is like focusing on your character growth. And so a question I have for you is actually um, like, were there moments in your career where you felt like you were um, instead of focusing on the character that you were kind of, um, for whatever reason, like at a space where you were focusing more on like an evaluation or some sort of like accomplishment that you're trying to get or, and then how did you like, you know, recenter yourself back into your values? Sorry, promise. Were you, were you asking me, or were you asking uh... um, you? And then I, it's open up to like the whole audience too. Sorry, I was a little distracted because the great Smith has just entered the the chat. Could you summarize the question super briefly, and then I'll and then I'll respond. I'm sorry, this is my bad. <laughs> no worries, Smith. We're so excited that you're here. <laughs> um, maybe promise if you could just kind of summarize the question for Moses, and then. Um... We'll, we'll welcome Smith and more. <laughs> yeah, um, basically, like, uh, are there any points in your career where you felt like you were, instead of focusing on the character that you were talking about, you kind of um, were in a space where you maybe, you know, maybe not what you wanted, but you were focusing on, like, trying to accomplish something, trying to get, like, you know, like, an accomplishment or like an evaluation or something like that and how did you recenter yourself back to your values and you know what you want to focus on yeah thank you for that question it's it's so important um i found clerkship year to be very challenging actually um i would say it was probably the the hardest time of my medical career i think i you know, everyone finds different parts of medical school and medical training hard. I really enjoyed the preclinical years. I'm a very nerdy person. Like, I don't mind memorizing biochemical pathways. I don't mind, uh, you know, being in anatomy. That part was was fine. Um, I found that clerkships for me represented this environment where I was constantly being watched, and I felt like I could. I, I and maybe it was all inside my head, but I, I felt a lot of self-judgment about everything I said, about facial expressions, about how I stood you know, in a group. Um, there was just this in intense self-scrutiny um, and, and an imagined or maybe real external scrutiny. Um, and I felt that my, my attention was split between trying to learn and trying to be a good team member and dealing with that anxiety. And it felt like I wasn't able to take full opportunity of the educational environment and to, you know, interact with patients the way I wanted to, because it was this internal monologue that was just running circles in my mind um, whenever I was in the hospital. And for me, clerkships were also difficult because I was used to a cycle of mastery that occurred on the time scale of a semester. You know, you start a class, you learn the material, you take a test, you do well, you get that positive feedback, and then you move to the next semester. And in contrast, I found that clerkships, like my, the pace of my improvement was not measured in weeks or months. It was many months, maybe the entire year. And I felt like I wasn't making progress. Um, and it was hard. It was like, is this only me? Am I, am I the only one that feels like I don't know what's going on? And I have no idea why I'm saying what I'm saying on presentations. Um, and it got to the point about three quarters of the way through where I was deeply unhappy and um, I was not feeling well. 
And so I approached the school and I told them, listen, I, I'd like to take a week off and um, I'll finish a, a one week block that we that we do as a later in, as part of my elective time. And I think taking that opportunity to meet with friends and to um, meet, talk to my family and to just maybe read some fiction, uh, you know, all these things that I had not been doing to just remind myself, wait, this is why I'm actually here, you know, reread my personal statement for medical school, um, sort of gain a little bit of confidence and say, you know what, I care what other people think, but only in so far as it makes me a better person on my terms. Um, and I was able to come back. And then my sub internship in medicine was incredible. And it confirmed that I wanted to be in internal medicine. And I should also say for, for everyone out there, like, throughout this feeling inside, like I was getting good grades, like it's possible to struggle and have that not be reflected in official eva evaluations. Like I was feeling very stressed, but externally, I think folks thought I was fine. Um, and so, you know, I, I, and I think that was true for part of residency too, the transition to a junior resident from an intern. But I think it was just so intense as a clerkship stu student, I was lucky to be able to develop some of this coping skills so that in future transitions, it was a little bit easier. Um, so I, I don't know if any of that strikes home, but that was my experience. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, no, I, I completely echo that. And um, as someone who just finished third year, I can <laughs> definitely identify with really the challenges that it takes. And I mean, it's, it's so fun in some ways, you're like jumping to a new rotation every month, but also it's, it's really challenging to balance. And um, I, you know, I personally struggled with like keeping up with, you know, how to maintain studying and getting strong scores in all of the various evaluations while also maintaining your friendships and um, the things that are important to you personally. So uh, it's really, it's, it means a lot to hear that other people have gone through something similar because it, um, it helps to kind of not feel alone and, and isolated in those, in those challenges. So thank you, Moses. Um, Smitha, I'm really so excited that that you're here, and I know you're on service right now, so I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to, to be here. I was wondering if you could kind of introduce yourself for people who don't know you, and um, if you have any reflections to what Moses shared. Of course. I'm. Hi, it's so nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Smitha. I um, am a hospitalist at um, UCSF. That feels weird to say because I just graduated residency um, and I was not supposed to be on service today, but unfortunately there was a service need that came up. So um, I got pulled this morning um, pretty last minute. So um, thank you all for your patience and um, just really excited to be here. And Moses, so much of what you said resonates, um, you know, just that feeling of like, am I good enough? Like, do I have what it takes? And it, and just sort of like having that grace for myself during third year, because like in a way you're starting a new job literally every month, like that's not normal. Um, and yet it just feels like, you know, what's expected of us and um, that constant um, adapting to new people, new standards, a new job um, so frequently uh, definitely took a toll on sort of my sense of self and my, uh, my confidence. Um, and so I appreciate you sharing that. And I appreciate um, uh, having this forum to kind of reflect on some of those challenges and um, and that sort of like threat to self. So um, yeah, really grateful to this community for that. Yeah, no, no, th thank you. I, I completely agree. And Smith, I'm not, I know if you have to jump back yeah. on the service, but if you have time, I would love to hear yeah. you know, if you had a story in mind related to the theme I wish I had known. Yeah, and um, I do apologize if I get paged away. It's possible, but I will do my best. And um, if you need to, just go. No, for it. <laughs> I'm okay right now. We're okay right now. Um, but it's possible that it may happen in the middle. Um, yeah, I have a story story that um, I was hoping to share for um, for today. Uh, when I first heard the kind of phrase, "I wish I had known," it actually really relates. Um, Moses, to kind of some of the themes that you had touched on. And I apologize if my story mirrors um, some of the ones that have already been, been shared as I'm joining late. But um, it, it, sort of the phrase that came up for me was kind of, I wish I had known that, you know, imposter syndrome was like not something that I would overcome. 
but actually that every time I faced a situation where, where I was, you know, faced with real unprecedented challenge, that rising to that challenge would always invoke some of those same feelings. Um, and I, I say that, and I think it kind of relates to some of the feelings that you were sharing around um, your third year, because, you know, at the end of my intern year, as a, as a sort of sole contributor, I had gotten to the place where I was like, I can do this. I can pre-round in the morning. I can see my patients. I can form these sort of strong relationships with patients. Um, you know, I feel like I'm learning and growing, but the cognitive load of like the everyday had kind of subsided to the point where I actually felt sort of a sense of self-efficacy at the end of intern year, um, where I'd sort of like climbed this learning curve um, and I was ready to be a senior resident. And I was really excited to be a senior resident, um, certainly nervous about what that transition would hold. Um, and so I had reached out to, to senior residents who I really looked up to, to kind of come up with a strategy and come up with my own style. Um, and I was really excited to take on that new challenge. I started as a senior resident on a, um, on a wards team at our busiest hospital. Um, and I just couldn't have imagined actually how challenging it was to step into a role of being the leader of a team while I still was growing so rapidly in my own clinical knowledge and, and, um, and like growing into my own as a physician. And, you know, there were eight people on the team, two or six people on the team. I was then attending two interns, two medical students and a pharmacy student. And I just felt like this feeling, Moses, that you had described of like all eyes on me. Like I had to have the answers all of a sudden when I myself actually now had more questions than I had answers. Um, and one particular kind of moment comes up for me when I think about that transition. Um, it was our first, we, I started on a call day. So it was a call day where we admit new patients. We can admit up to six new patients. And actually the morning had been quite quiet. Um, this was in the middle of the um, pandemic. Um, and so we were kind of newly admitting COVID patients as well. And um, the medical school had actually given us guidance that the medical students actually should not be caring for COVID positive patients. So I read through all these guidelines beforehand um, and sort of went into this um, call day. And um, I, uh, the morning was actually quite it was quiet. We didn't actually get any admits. And then around three or 4 PM, all of a sudden we got like paged for four admits at once. Um, so I'm like triaging these, these patients. Um, and we got one patient who is an older woman um, with COPD who is here for a COPD exacerbation. So in my mind, I was like, this is perfect. Like COPD is so bread and butter. Um, this is a perfect case for um, one of our third year medical Student. And so I was super excited to have um, our intern, who is also really interested in, in teaching, um, sort of go down to admit the patient with, um, with our brand new third year medical student um, and kind of walk through the case and walk through the management of COPD. So they went downstairs to see this patient. And about four, 30 to 40 minutes later, I get a stat page from the micro lab. Um, and the page said, you know, this patient that I had just sent the intern and the medical student down to go see was positive for COVID. Um, and I was just moving so quickly that all of a sudden I was like, I need to let the intern and medical student know. So I went down from the 14th floor to the first floor, which was like the longest four minutes of my life to get down to the ED to tell them. Um, that the patient was COVID positive, and I could see that they were wearing a surgical mask, um, not an N95, um, and eye protection. And I sort of tapped on the glass and asked them to come outside. And I let them know, you know, the patient was COVID positive. And immediately, I could kind of just see that um, the medical student was, uh, and I apologize, I realize I'm using the term medical student only to protect the student's identity and recognizing that this person is, um, you know, way more than this term or label that I'm, I'm currently using. Um, but she was very, um, you know, upset. And I was moving so quickly that I had, she had actually hesitated when I had given her the patient. I didn't make eye contact with her to recognize 
those signs. She had actually tried to tell me that the patient's COVID test um, was still pending. And I just, I just didn't receive any of those signals. Um, and, you know, she had other reasons for also not, um, not sort of being in the position to care for COVID patients. And I had completely overlooked all of that. And I had failed, um, I had failed that student and I had, you know, failed in my role as a leader of the team. Um, and I really, I like at that point looked her in the eye and really apologized. Um, and, um, you know, she excused herself and I just felt like, you know, there were still four patients to be seen. There were no admit orders in. I was like failing as, you know, a uh, like leader of the team. And I just felt this like crushing sense of like self doubt. Um, and I was holding all of these different hats at once and actually not wearing any of them, you know, well. Um, and it was really hard. It was really hard um, because I remember as a third year medical student feeling like I, like why is my senior resident not sort of responsive to my needs and concerns? And here I was now as a senior medical medical or senior resident, completely ignoring the like concerns and needs of the third year medical student who I was supposed to be, um, who I was supposed to be sort of leading through this experience and journey. Um, and it was a really hard few days. Um, and then, you know, every mistake, everything that happened thereafter was sort of reinforcing this narrative that like I wasn't good enough. Um, and I actually um, had a kind of debrief session with my attending where I sort of shared some of this, these concerns and like, you know, bawling and like totally just like really vulnerable. Um, and, and she shared this with me where she was like this, this feeling of imposter syndrome, this like, I'm not good enough. Like, it's not something to overcome. And it's actually just this feeling of being faced with challenge and uncertainty. And as long, and like, as long as that I was harnessing that for growth and, and like, didn't allow it to sort of like corrode my sense of self that actually that that was a really important feeling. Um, and so, you know, it took a while. It took honestly the rest of that month of really growing, making similar mistakes. But, um, you know, I, I eventually got to the point in second year where I did feel like I had a similar sense of self-efficacy that I was able to get to an intern year. But it was, it was so acute because I had such high hopes and high standards for who I would be as a senior resident. Um, so I'll pause there. I, I um, you know, it brings up, I think, similar themes, um, Moses, that you, you had touched on, um, but feel very grateful that, you know, between my co-residents, this community, my attending on that service, that I was able to sort of um, have a safe space to sort of share some of that vulnerability. Yeah, Smitha, that was such an impactful story for, for me to hear. And I see I think we're getting a lot of reactions to that. Um, I think a lot of other people would just felt that to be really, really impactful. Um, one thing that you said that really struck me is, you know, you mentioned this imposter syndrome, which I think at this point is something that's kind of like a universal feeling or experience that we all face at various points. And what really struck me is you described it as like not something to overcome and, you know, potentially you don't ever completely overcome it, but using it as a, um, a source of growth, basically. And I think that's, I just hadn't really thought of it in that way, because a lot of times imposter syndrome is talked about, you know, something to like get past and potentially you never get past it. You just like harness it in a different way. And, um, I just, the story that you shared, I mean, it seems like such a difficult transition where you're both a trainee, but you've also taking on this role of leading a team. You're also a teacher and you just have all of these different hats you're trying to wear. And I'm curious, you know, from that challenging experience, you know, how has that changed the way you approach those various roles later in residency, you know, at, you're a new hospitalist, like, has that affected kind of the way you, you go about those jobs? It's a really good question. And, you know, I am just starting, like you said, um, this role as a hospitalist. So some of those similar feelings are coming up as I'm on teaching services or being the one to introduce myself as an attending. And I will say it is a softer transition, I think in part because of this mind shift. And um, a few things that I have I've tried to do is actually I, I find a lot of um, strength in community and in 
in sharing some of these feelings. So with my team, I, I say, you know, like, I'm feeling this, like, you know, the like butterflies and the heart palpitations, because I feel like I'm supposed to have all the answers. And I, as the attending, I'm still learning. And medicine is this journey of lifelong learning. So I will be really honest when I don't know something and do my very best to help us find the answer. Um, And I, yeah, I think like just that mind shift from like imposter syndrome, like isn't some disease disease that like I or we or a group of us suffer from like it's this normal response to like internalizing just impossibly high standards and like that doubting myself like doesn't mean I'm going to fail it it actually is just that I'm faced with this new challenge and that like actually it's the precursor to like like a ton of learning and growth Um, and so just like allowing like grace and then also like sharing that journey with other people has helped me feel better. And I've actually, I think that speaks to the kind of culture that I'm in. I have not been met with, gosh, like you're so dumb, you know, like how come you didn't know that it's, it is really like, I feel like it has helped me create community. It has helped deepen relationships that I have. Um, And so like, even the process of struggling with it has for me, like, served, you know, other purposes, meaning like creating community with other people. So I don't, I don't have the answer. Um, but all that to say, I think like struggling with others has been helpful. Smitha, just to reflect on your story, because I think it's, it's one that speaks to me. It reminds me of my very first day as a, as a junior resident leading a team. Um, I think one of the reasons, at least for me, why this feeling is so powerful is because, and maybe this isn't unique to medicine, but it certainly features in medicine, is that a huge part of our role touches on core aspects of being human. And in in the form of um, connecting with people in crisis, um, dealing with the psychological, social implications of what happens to people's bodies and minds, and when we feel like we fail in that context, it's not, it feels not just like a professional failure. It feels like it touches on our own humanity and our capacity to sort of be human, at least for me, in, in its worst forms. And I think something that touches so close to home, to core values, to like who you identify as as a human, um, has the potential to cause a lot of distress. And when something doesn't go right, it's not just isolated to that. It, it feels like we extrapolate it to the entirety of ourself. And I feel like that, well, one, the, the, just recognizing that, like that's part of what this role is, is that we are connecting with humans in, in very sort of critical moments and just naming it to ourselves and to other people has been, has been huge. Um, I remember the first day I was a, a junior, I, I had, was called in from a Jeopardy pool to cover a cardiology team. And I remember getting to the end of the day and I was totally flustered. I, my organizational system as an intern did not translate as a, as a resident. And I got to the end of the day and I was running the list with the attending and just like patient after patient, it's like, oh, did you do X? Oh, I realized X did not get done. And we just kept going down the list and my spirits were just sinking lower and lower and lower. And at the end, I thought like, wow, I thought I was a pretty good intern. Maybe I should not be in medicine because like, I'm getting nothing done here. And I left just shell shocked. And I think the lesson I took from that is I, I texted one of my the PGY3s and the generosity of spirit of just saying, stop, I will meet you at this restaurant. We're going to spend the next two hours talking about this. And that's what I think brings me through. It's opening up, talking about it in the appropriate moment, being concrete about learning from others and then turning around and doing the same for other people. Totally. I I love kind of how you framed that just like, because this job, it's, you know, it's not, uh, my partner's not in medicine and like the level of distance he has from work is just, it's both not one that I you know, think I can emulate and one that like I want to emulate, you know, because it, it is, it's so vulnerable and like 
stepping into that position and really bringing my full self, like I, I think is, is a strength. It allows me to be hopefully the best physician I can be, but there is, it's double, you know, that same strength can also double as, um, a real weakness and Achilles heel and that it has then the potential to like destabilize kind of that core as well. Um, and, you know, some of what I shared from kind of how I think about imposter syndrome is ver verbatim taken from a quote from Adam Grant, um, who tweets a lot of about some of this stuff in terms of like bringing up bringing ourselves and showing up in the workplace. Um, and, and I agree, Moses, I think like just being able to process and share um, and connect with other people has been so, so helpful. I don't know. I would love to learn from other folks because I don't think I have it down. I'm like certainly feeling a lot of those same things, you know, as I undergo this transition. So it is still a work in progress. I just wanted to say that I'm so glad that Madalena, that you set this up because um, I feel very similar to what Moses, you shared. Um, now that I'm on surgery rotation, working with my attending one-on-one -on -one without anyone else on the team, I just constantly feel very incompetent. Like, I don't know anything. I don't know how to make a list. I don't know anything. And so just being here and hearing you guys who are much, like you guys have advanced, you know, past my point in my training and um, everything that I'm learning from your lessons, like it's been so encouraging. <laughs> Third year is really hard, promise. Yeah, promise. Well, first, Moses and Smitha, I think I'm just um, still just processing all of the amazing, I guess, like wisdom you shared, basically. And I uh, just really appreciate you taking the time to like reflect on those and um, share those experiences and kind of what helped you move through them with all of us. Um, I know I've I'm taking really a lot away from what you said. And um, promise, I, I would love for you to just, you know, share any story that you wanted to to bring here. And I know that um, there's a lot of similar themes from what Moses and Smith have shared, even though we're at, you know, you're at a very earlier stage in your training. I think it's interesting how the themes are so similar, even at different stages. Um, so, you know, would love to hear what you have to say. Uh, hi, my name is Paloma. I'm from Mexico. I recently graduated from internal medicine. And well, I just uh, really uh, feel kind of empathy when uh, Samita will uh, talk, talk to us about the, uh, <laughs> this leading process when you start, when you have a team, when you are now presenting yourself as the attending. And you, you, I also felt that pressure that I have to have all the answers because that's how uh, the school can kind of te teach you. So um, I have been in many situations. I have no imagine I could have um, these kind of uncertainties. And uh, you, um, Moses said something that really took me back to what I kind of do, kind of do to to get on and to be able to think and take on my decisions and that's uh, recenter to to your to your values. Recenter to your values she always is going to help you to reframe and restart and to get to see the big picture and to make a best decision. Always something that's really important to me when I have many uncertainties. So sometimes uh, in internal medicine in Mexico, we are uh, really sometimes limited by uh, another specialties because we have not uh, the mm, and the ability to not, not the ability the the power to uh, assure some procedures so maybe i need a lot of help from a lot of uh, uh, specialists to get the treatment complete for the patient so sometimes i have to uh, um, talk to the families and 
say that um, we have this plan, we know what's next, but we are still waiting for other people to solve this problem, to get this study, to get this procedure. And so it's like um, trying to talk to them and make them see that you have a plan, that you know what's going on, you know how to treat the patient, you are doing something about its condition right now, but you still have to wait. And that's sometimes a situation that makes me have make me feel like uh, I'm tired of hands. <laughs> and so um, uh, I, I try always to look for other way to take um, faster and well try to make some try to try to do something for the patient and I think that uh, sometimes it gets through my heart and it kind of strolls myself and I think that uh, it's really important to remember that we are more than just um, male people that we have many or other interests and sometimes we are forced to drop them off, to be able to have this kind of work and all this career we choose. And sometimes it, um, it takes part of our, ourselves and it's up to us to take care of all, all, all those other things that make us happy and actually complete this huge, po this huge puzzle we are. So, and it's really important to take care of us as much as we take care of our patients. Hello, Matt. I so, so appreciate you unmuting and introducing yourself and, and sharing that. I, um, just, it takes a lot of courage to, sh you know, share challenging experiences we've had and your reflection was so powerful for me to hear and you can see the reactions you're getting. Um, so Paloma, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your voice and, and your reflections on that. I think um, we, all, uh, we all learned a lot from what you, from what you shared. So thank, thank you, you Paloma. for the space. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know we're, we're like, have maybe 10 more minutes left, but promise I really, I know that you prepared something you wanted to share and I really would, um, we would love to learn from you. Um, I can I, make it free. Um, and I think it pretty much everyone has touched on the themes of my story. Um, it's about how I learned about self-compassion and how that has transformed my approach to learning in medical school. And I think I wanted to start off with like the context of it. I uh, moved to the US um, in middle school and with my family and I was feeling very lost and I didn't have a lot of guidance early on. So that's kind of when I started developing this mindset of comparing myself with my peers as a way to gauge where I'm going and to know that I am heading where I want to be and I'm on track. Um, and I think that mindset uh, carried me through in college as a pre-med and I find myself comparing with my peers a lot because I didn't want to experience like a competitive disadvantage in the application process. And I um, think that this mindset continued to carry over in my first year of medical school where I placed very high expectations on myself. And I thought that, you know, I have to be doing X, Y, Z, just like everyone else is. And I was constantly feeling very anxious and stressed trying to meet those expectations. I never felt like I was enough. And I also started the medical school during the pandemic. So it was fully online for me. That whole process felt very lonely. And I felt like I was like a pre-med um, going through this all alone. Um, and I really doubted medicine because I didn't think that this was this kind of medicine that I signed up for. And I struggled to feel like I belong to like any kind of community in that whole time. Um, and I think uh, that made all of those negative feelings kind of just like exacerbated. And by second semester of my first year, I started experiencing signs and symptoms of depression that I've never experienced before. And I tried really hard to fix myself, but I ended up just like 
feeling really guilty, really frustrated and disappointed. And I think I wanted to take a pause here and say, you know, looking back, I wish I knew that there's nothing wrong with me. And like medicine is really hard and it's not meant to go through alone. And um, like I wanted to share that if you're feeling this way, like you're not alone and you're not defective in any way. And that was kind of how I felt. Um, so I tried to figure it out on my own, but I wasn't really getting anywhere. So it took a lot of courage to finally reach out to uh, my school faculty and um, work and then to get support from there. And kind of like what Moses shared, like it was like a very, very low point for me where I was just, I need help because I just can't do this anymore on my own. And then um, I had to work through the barriers to try therapy for the first time and with a therapist that's when I realized I've kind of been always operating on like a negative reinforcement system and like kind of on like self punishment like and that I had to learn to unlearn being harsh on myself and to learn to be kind to myself. And in my the end of my first year, that's when I discovered CP solvers. And my first episode was actually the woman DX with Smith, uh, Smith that you facilitated. And I just for the first time, I really found the joy of learning again. And I really enjoy applying my knowledge and solving cases with everyone in like a very collaborative and team setting. And then that's how I learned about the importance of clinical reasoning too. Um, it made me realize that getting questions right on exam shouldn't be the only way to measure my knowledge and my learning progress. So for my second year of med school, um, I wrote two goals for myself. The first one is to set boundaries with work and school for my own well-being. And then the second one is that I decided to take ownership of my learning. So um, instead of just being evaluated with one grade and I decided to write my own performance evaluation system that includes other measure of growth and um, the like I can share here if I have like a couple categories so one is consistency effort attitude uh, knowledge which breaks down into can I explain this my clinical reasoning skills and the last one is my grade and then character and faith and then which is the most important to me and then now that i'm in third year i added one more category um, with clinical work and skills and so i found that this just really helped me to see that you know it's not just a grade to the side where i'm at and like my learning but that there are all these other character development and um, all these other criteria that goes into um, like where I'm progressing and where I feel like uh, like where I'm at and then also for my third year I've also found that writing down my values and my purpose um, in my first page of notebook like the best decision ever because when I have really difficult situations with patients or attendings that make me feel very fearful or doubtful of myself, I could just refer to that and then I can remind myself like this is why I'm here for medicine and this is who I believe myself to be um, and so I think the results of learning to let go of all these expectations I have for myself and learning to be very kind to myself is it made me to be a better learner um, to perform better at school and to be able to be more present and um, take care of patients better just because I can have more empathy and compassion and I've also found that it's very freeing once I've adopted this mindset because like these are the lessons that I wish I had knew earlier that self-compassion would allow me to enjoy learning, enjoy seeing myself grow and be content with my progress. And I don't always have to be striving for the next thing and constantly feeling not enough, which I really feel like in medicine is so easy to fall into that mindset and that it allows me to focus on my purpose of being the best learner I can be and serving others to the best of my ability and becoming the person and the doctor I want to be. And I'm really grateful for this space too, just because, like I said, it's been so encouraging to hear all the stories. And I think the theme here is, you know, like a community um, sharing is very powerful. And I'm saying this to myself because to be completely honest, I've been struggling to keep up with this mindset now that I'm working with my attending one-on-one -on -one in surgery and he expects a lot. 
Um, but the point I wanted to make is um, very similar to what Smith has shared is like, this is something that I've struggled with and I continue to struggle with um, learning to unlearn these self expectations, self uh, comparisons and this like self dialogue um, and learning to give myself grace. And, um, and I think that is the process of like, the more you do, the better and like the easier it becomes and like it's easier to transition the next time these feelings kind of show up again. Um, and I think that this is where I need to be kind to tell myself that I am enough and I don't need to feel like a failure when I don't know something in front of the attending or when I make a mistake because I'm trying my best to learn and take care of patients every day. And I think in my journal, I wrote down like what would self-compassion look like next week would be, um, you know, don't get upset and be kind to myself when I feel very incompetent in front of my attending. And instead of worrying about his evaluations of me, I am going to remind myself that it doesn't matter what grade, what recognition, appreciation or evaluation I get, because at the end of the day, if I can look back knowing that I've done my best to learn and take care of patients, then I can be content and satisfied with my myself. Thomas, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I think I'm just a little bit speechless from what you shared, I from everything, but especially just like writing your own performance evaluation system is just so, such an amazing way that you've like transformed this really difficult period into something that works for you and has inspired me. And it seems like a lot of other people. Um, just thank you so much, Promise, for being here and for sharing that. And it's not easy to do. And um, you have inspired me and a lot of other people, as I said. Moses, you put something, and just I want to kind of see, Moses, if you have anything to share. It sounds like you had similar experiences and wrote something in your fourth year. Do you want to share anything about that? Sure. First of all, Promise, what a beautiful encapsulation of your journey and some of the things that you've done to you know, take charge of, of this experience. Um, I, I had very, a very similar experience to what you're describing in some ways and, um, had the opportunity to write a little bit about it. There was an essay that Atul Gawande had written back in 2011 called personal best. And, um, in that essay, he described how, even as a full fledged attending, uh, he had a more senior surgeon come into the operating room and be a coach for him. And. I read that essay and I started thinking to myself, wow, I wish, I wish I had a coach. And I wish that someone would help me <laughs> in that way. And in talking to friends and in just thinking about it, I also ended up realizing, you know, I think with support, I can be my own coach. Like I know what I value. I know the kind of person I want to be. The process of medical school often, at least for me, um, created an environment in which I, I handed over control over how I viewed myself to other people. And me writing that was taking some of that back and saying, no, I, I know who I want to be. I, I, I can define this for myself. And I had a little journal that I would write in again, you know, I think promise has said this also beautifully. I don't have anything to add. I want to, you know, just leave space for that reflection. If folks are interested, I can send proofs to what I wrote. But honestly, uh, I think what you said, Promise, was uh, it was just a wonderful encapsulation. So I'll leave it there. Promise, thank you so much. I'm just echoing everything that's been coming through the chat, just your bravery, your sort of um, to like develop this own tool to really reflect back on your values is so incredibly inspiring. And, you know, it, it does speak to the ongoing structural issues, both in our medical education system and also in our care delivery systems that make the individual feel as if we have some sort of defect that needs to be corrected. When in reality, you know, it, it's probably just a symptom of a system that needs to change. And I think there are efforts to try to improve, improve that, but in the meantime, 
sort of like what you and what um, you and Moses have said, like, how do we regain some control and, um, you know, brace ourselves against what is a very hard training system um, to go through and come out the other end being empathetic, um, curious, um, and excited uh, physicians. I think that is still something that we as a, as a healthcare system, as an education system are working on. And I think efforts like this are, are crucial to helping to, to affect that and impact that, um, that change. Um, thank you all. I unfortunately do need to step away to go see a patient, but this has been such a beautiful discussion and I feel like so grateful. And actually this is exactly what I needed in the middle of a, of a busy shift. And I, I so appreciate all of you um, being here and sharing. Yeah, Smita, thank you so much for taking time out of being um, on service and for sharing your story and um, all of your wisdom. So we are really grateful for that. And um, it, Moses or Prawns, if you had any last words, please unmute and share. Um, if not, I know it's past the hour, so I wanted to be respectful of everyone's time. All right. Well, just thank you all again. Thank you to Moses and Smitha and Promise for really your, your courage. And um, I think that's kind of just what I'm struck by, just the courage and how much you've inspired me and it seems like a lot of people. And I think, you know, Smitha has mentioned that there's a lot of you know, structural challenges that we're up against, but I think, um, kind of how you've ind individually navigated these setbacks has been really inspiring to me. And thank you everyone for, for tuning in and um, hope to see you at the, at the next discussion. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your Sunday.